It's a great day to flex your freedom. I'm your host, Barb Allen. I am going to start this one right off because I have been saying I should do this for a while and I don't and I pay the price. I'm very fortunate to have two parents who are very interested in what we're doing here. They love to watch our shows. However, I often hear some shock and horror from them. So I'm going to just say right now, mom and dad, don't watch this one. We're going to drop the F-bomb. It's coming. Please don't watch it or watch it, but don't say you weren't warned because <laughs> that's sort of a theme in this in our guest's life, um, but not in the way you think it is. So you will learn something if you could just get past the, the F-bomb, but don't say you weren't warned. That goes for anybody else who may not necessarily enjoy hearing the word. It's going to be not the only word we say, but just don't say you weren't warned because I love, I personally love how today's guest describes what he does. I think it is on point. It is straight. I've had different jokes about it, but basically he helps people unfuck themselves, right? <laughs> that is like the best word. I used to joke around yeah. that, um, what a, what a power that would be if somebody had the unfuck button, right? Like how we could all use that in a superpower in our own lives. However, I think we mean it in different ways, but you, I mean, in all seriousness, our guest today, Wiley McGraw, not only has he led multiple lives, each one of which is fascinating. You could write a book or a movie about from baseball to bull riding to combat service um, in our United States military, all of which have taught him profound and deep lessons about life and about himself and about the world and how it goes and challenging and pushing yourself. And today he is a hugely sought after, not a coach, he's a performance accelerator and a leadership strategist, st strategist. I can't even say the word, so I clearly can't be one. But um, this is what he does today for people from all walks of life who are up on multiple levels of success to I'm, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that people he meets and works with as well. I don't think you discriminate who you work with, Wiley, but we're going to get into that. Maybe you do, um, but for good reason and good cause. Okay. Yeah. So if you are somebody who is working through, I don't know a single person who doesn't have a demon they need to slay in their life. So just don't pretend you're not one and sit back and get ready to listen to this episode here because we're going to get into it. Wiley, right. thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Barb, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I look forward to diving into all those juicy little things you just discussed with your audience. <laughs> it is great. I love it when people just kind of get to the point. My my kids, I had uh, you know four boys I raised. They used to always tell me like, mom, you're more of a dude than a chick. And I don't know, maybe it's because I curse a lot, but I don't know. I know chicks curse too, but it's just the way I am. I prefer the direct path. I prefer the bluntness. Yeah. I prefer people who aren't going to tiptoe around. I think it's a right. waste of time. If, you come, if I come to you for help, Wiley, I don't want you to worry about not hurting my feelings, right? right? I want you to help me fix myself right? And, and fix my life. And I don't, I think, uh, I think, you know, like when nerve you're burned and your nerve endings regrow, that hurts, right? But it's, it's hurt to heal and hurt to grow and regenerate. And I think that's part of it. You can't just make yourself feel better. So yes. let's get into it a little bit yeah. for our guests who don't know you. Let's go a little bit through your background, because like I said, we could spend probably 12 different shows on it, right? Oh, um, of course. But, yeah, well, I'm definitely writing. Yeah, I'm definitely writing a book eventually uh, on some of these stories because it's it's really about uncovering the deeper parts of of our hu own human performance and what really actually hinders us, limits us, holds us back. And there's so many different ways in which we approach transformation and change and growth. Um, I have discovered in my own quest after I got out of the military, and we can go back to that in a moment, Barb. That there was a yeah. huge uh, gap in um, people's achievement of success and where they actually currently are on that path of, of growth and, and self-mastery. And for me in the personal development space, I, I saw that blind spot and I recognized the gift that I possessed, what I was really meant to be doing. And I wanted to close that gap and really get people to experience this ultimate level of, of peace and freedom along what it is that they're out in the world trying to accomplish. So that was a big part of my journey as well. But going back to what you said, it's, you know, the word the F-bombs, the cuss words, they are used uh, tastefully. I, unfucking right. someone's life is not um, something you go to school for. It's not a, you know, like a thing you learn from someone else. It's really a calling. It's a, a true purpose that I was born into this world to do. And people can ask that question. What does that mean? Does that mean that I'm, I'm effed up? You know, and, it, it, and I would say, honestly, if you want to be real with yourself, just say, yes, you are. And until yes. you slay your demons, it doesn't mean yeah. you're bad. It doesn't mean you're wrong. Right. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're less than or you're unworthy. It just means you're human. And when you look at the ailments that you possess, things you come into this world surrounded by, trauma, setbacks, obstacles. And I talk about it on a video on my website at wileymcgraw.com, succinctly and understanding that's who you are as a human being, but that's not where you are meant to stay. 
you can understand then what it means to be unfucked, what it looks like, what it takes, what is required of you, the commitments that you need to uh, put yourself through so that you can experience that unleashing, if you will. Yeah. And so you learned that, I mean, you've had a whole life rich yeah. life history in the different ways you've learned that. So let's walk our, our audience a little bit through each, each stage, because it is a core part of your story and sure. each stage you pulled nuggets from, right? I so, have. um, you know, growing up, your dad was, was he semi-professional baseball player? Semi-pro ball player in the seventies. Uh, San Jose bees was the name of the team. And I, you know, I, I tell the story so much. It's almost like now I have no I problem. Know. We can condense it. You don't have it's to go fine. through all It's fine. And I'm highlight. absolutely happy to tell your audience because they don't know yeah. who I am anyway. So right. at the end of the day, it, the experiences I had were mine and mine alone. But what I, I paid attention to was the, the versions of myself um, that were great and weren't great in each of those experiences. And I started to recognize that at a young age, being brought into the world as a baseball player is not something I got to choose, Barb. It wasn't a, uh, you know, a, a life choice of I want to be a baseball player or I want to be a scientist or a paleontologist. None of those things were my choice. My father recognized athletic uh, talent and he cultivated it at a very young age. So I grew up, all I knew was baseball. Now, of course, I played other sports, but baseball was the primary focus. And as I got older and I, I was honed as this pitcher because of my arm strength and my speed and my accuracy, um, I fell in love with the game. But as that journey continued and as I started to develop my own personality, I started to come into my own, I started to recognize the perfectionism that wasn't allowing me to be my best from my father's incessant push to be only a pitcher, a star athlete focused solely on getting to a place where I can become a major league baseball player, I started to rebel internally. It's like my own mindset started to challenge itself. And I started to recognize quickly that something was amiss. This is not fulfilling. It wasn't really where I found my true passion. I started to, to recognize at a young age, something was off with the stresses of my family life, the way in which my father was expecting me to perform. And I challenged that. When I got to a point where it was just too much for me to take, I sought after these more unbelievable real world challenges. I wanted to find out what else I was capable of accomplishing. Who the hell was Wiley McGraw outside of my father, outside of what I was expected to be? And the world of rodeo came knocking. I started to hang around with different types of people. Well, I let met, me let me yeah. uh, interrupt here and yeah, ask. A couple things. Um, so how old were you when you took the leap out of baseball? Uh, I was getting ready to graduate high school. Oh, okay. So like really young. All right. Yeah. So that's actually, that's actually really good to hear because I want to, I want to dig into this for a little bit for the Please. sake of people that I know who have kids who are graduating high school um, or kids who are graduate. I just, I have my four kids made it through high school. Thank God. But you know, when they're at that stage and they're figuring out what to do next, a lot of times, and even kids in college, I have my kids who are in college or who made it through college already, so have told me over and over again, how many kids are in college, for instance, because their parents make them, the parents want them, the parents say, you're going to graduate, right. you're going to, because this is the vision I have for you. So you're right. going to graduate. And a lot of these kids are growing into young adults who are living their lives focused on the path that their parents have planned for them. Right. And I know a lot of it is done out of love and care and concern. Maybe some of it is like parents projecting their own issues on their kids and wanting them to fulfill their own dreams for them. They can live yeah. through them or whatever it is. But so what would be your words now to both a, to parents who have kids who are facing these decisions, who are maybe their late teens, early twenties, like facing life decisions mm. on paths they want to take and are feeling pushed into one direction. And what would be your words to kids in that age frame or young adults in that age frame who feel like they're being pushed by their parents into mm. one path and Love how to how mm -hmm. to find the oomph to like, to s jump out of it. We can unpack that for days, but yeah. for the parents, first and foremost, which is a key component, even the work that I do today is people that are in positions of authority have massive influence on others that are around them. So parents have obviously massive influence on the development of their child. That's the point of being a parent is creating yeah. an environment for your child to come into their own. But, our culture, our culture, generation after generation, excuse me, has 
lost their way with providing their children these environments to discover who they were brought into this world to become. Because it comes from multiple places, it is love, but it's also fear. There's also an incessant push to protect rather than trust in the hardships of life itself to develop and unleash and uncover what your child, their individualism is supposed to actually become. So we have parents that expect their children to follow a specific path because it seems like the best, safest route for that child. Yes, the kid may have some skills, but have you ever given your child permission to make horrible mistakes, to rebel against your authority, to push back when they, you tell them to do something they don't really feel like doing or they don't, they don't see themselves as being good at? We don't have parents that do that nowadays, which is why so many kids grow up and get into a job they eventually regret and start to stress and feel broken, feel unfulfilled, feel unsatisfied, yet nobody gives them that atmosphere. So they just push through that and they create from that pain and that sacrifice and they never get to experience real peace with their life. And for the children listening or like young kids that are paying attention or whoever it wants to understand this is, if you start to notice internally conflict around your thinking, around your feelings and emotions, about what your parents are telling you you should be focusing on or, or doing. That's an indicator that you need to honor that part of you trying to tell you something so you can get through it and utilize it as an asset for your growth. And having conversations that might be difficult are the key to breaking through. Maybe your parents push for you to do what they expect you to do. In my world, I didn't do that. I just broke away from it because my dad didn't want to hear anything I had to say. So for me, I didn't care anymore. I was going to go do what I wanted to do because I felt that was the path for me. And when I got into the world of rodeo from what my dad expected of me, that's where this version of Wiley was unleashed. I listened to myself. I honored, despite not knowing what was going to come or what it meant, I still listened to it. And if there are people yeah. that are out there listening, have the conversations if you can. You don't have to go down my path where you just walked away from it, but you can have those conversations that are uncomfortable. Go, this doesn't feel right, mom, dad, et cetera. I want to pursue something else that really allows me to become what I, I feel I'm supposed to become, not what I'm expected to become. Yeah. And that yeah. can be hard as a parent, especially yeah. when it's something um, that you really just worry about for them. <laughs> You sure. know, like you're kind of paralyzed in fear for the choice that they have made or they are making, but you have to throw, you have to like, they're their people, right? They're going to, if it is a terrible mistake and they live to regret it and it hurts them through life, like that's their path to walk. Like we can't, nothing we do will ever protect them, right? From, well, that's the from, thing is you can give them guardrails. You can yeah. give them I, the same thing. It's, it's not about giving them systems to follow. It's about giving them frameworks, right. standards that they can adopt learning about themselves through their mistakes, honoring the mistakes just as much as the successes, finding balance right. in that. Parents don't do that. They, they almost make failure mm, the thing to avoid. And then they celebrate only when things are good and when they're successful. But that's, that's the problem right there. If you don't give yeah. balance to both failures and successes, which are one and the same, essentially, your kid's going to always be left wondering what else, what more. And they're going to feel that fear of the unknown and they're never going to embrace the unknowns that come with life's challenges where the real magic lies, where real transformation happens. Love it. So when you left and then, and you were in the rodeo world, how did you do that? How were you supporting yourself? Were you just like completely then on your own as a like 19 ish year old? I was younger than that. <laughs> younger 17 year old yeah. kid who I, had to um, go. So you're in a world with men then you're in a world yes. with cowboy. I've been around rodeo. I, I know what goes on around rodeos. Um, and that's, yeah. uh, you know, that is not a, PG or G rated world. And it yeah. will, um, I mean, there's nice people, there's lovely people, like people who would do anything to help you. And yet there's also sure. the kill or be killed <laughs> mindset in there. People would chew you up and spit you out. Right. So it's very, yeah. it's very gritty, yeah. very gritty. It's very, yeah. I would say holistic. I'm going to use that term. And that just means it's more whole picture when it comes to life. I, I find now, they, there is extremism in that world as well. You know, yeah. these rodeo cowboys use alcohol, tobacco products. There's a lot of fist fighting, different elements of the more, you know, I would say, erratic, rough and tough vibe that comes along with being in rodeo. But 
you know, I met certain people. I was 16 when I got in the back of my first bull. And I, re- I met certain people that were, you know, in their <laughs> oh 20s, PRCA, 16. you know, International yeah. Pro Rodeo. And they, they took me under their wing and they started to mentor me because I felt alive in that environment. I felt that they yeah. allowed me to be who I wanted to be. I met a version of myself that I've been dying to meet, this more warrior nature, this, this, this grit and focus that I possess that didn't really get cultivated in baseball the way that it should have, because baseball is a phenomenal sport and it's all about perfecting skills. But that world, how I navigated, of course, working a job, making myself some money so I can afford my my activities of being trained and being and being mentored, et cetera. I just dealt with the consequences of my actions and my decisions to be a rodeo cowboy. Regardless of how my family treated me, how they looked at me, I didn't care because I felt alive. I felt excited about what would come from each ride that I was unaware. What it was dangerous. I could get hurt. I could get killed. And I didn't, I didn't care about that. I was excited about learning about myself, being emotional, being focused, being mentally fit, learning my intuition and what that meant. Every time I got in the back of an 1800 pound wild animal, feeling the life force connection with this, this split second decision-making process on how to ride an animal to me, that's why I was able to navigate it so well, because it allowed me to be completely completely who I wanted to be, who I felt I was supposed to be. Awesome. And once you stretch like that, once you, what your muscles are stretched, whether it's by choice doing what you did, or I have found through trauma, uh, it's still an adrenaline stretch, right? You're, you, you are stretched beyond the capacity yeah. of what you thought you could do. And you right. realize that you now live on like this higher vibration almost. Yes. It, you can't, you can't put that back in the bottle. No, like that, no you that can't. Never, <laughs> You like can. you never unstretch, right? Like right. that's, so you just need to, you need to find a path that's going to be purposeful and healthy and positive to, to meet that demand. I think that demand for the adrenaline and the challenge and the push, and like, you're always trying to do something to push yourself where you could fall flat on your safe either, face, either figuratively mm-hmm. or literally, literally. right? Yep. Yep. And so the, the key is to find a meaningful, purposeful way to fill that need or to, because it is a need, it's a drive, right? It Um, is. Do you come across people then in your line of work now who are filling that in a, in a negative way or just not filling it purposefully? And is that where, and then we'll go back to your military service. That's sure. No, of course. And I, Um, but Barb, if I can, I'm going to add on what you just said. The biggest beautiful thing about rodeo was that it forced me in real time to, to face and learn how to yield to the fear of the unknown. Right. And I took that with me every, every step of the way with my life from that point forward, where I recognize that fear itself can kill our dreams, but fear also can support accelerating us to our dreams. If we know how to yield to it and use it properly, we get taught constantly, learn how to conquer your fear, override your fear, overcome your fear. And unfortunately, I think that is a misconception when it comes to human performance and understanding ourselves, because fear is an inherent part of who we are. Fear is not going anywhere. It's never going to disappear. You can't get rid of it. What you can learn Mm -hmm. how to do is yield to it and utilize it for your success, for your growth, for the path that you're on. When you become one with it and have a relationship with it that doesn't hinder you, it can only uplift you because when it shows up, that means you're facing something real that's going to change you. You're not being yeah. chased by a wild animal or falling off a cliff. So I just wanted to share that quickly. But going forward, I work with prominent, and powerful people. I work with leaders, celebrities, professional athletes. It doesn't matter their industry or their background. These are just motivated, high achievers who have created their lives on the back of their demons, their chaos, their stress. They've never been given a real environment to face them. And so they are, in fact, doing what you just asked is, yes, they are doing it in a negative way. And they've never been given the challenges that allow them to face down those very fears or terrors to truly unleash more of their power and potential and optimize in their lives so they don't experience that roller coaster of chaos that is typical to accompany someone's you know level of success like that. So I, I see it all the time, which is why when they come to me, they're in a position where I've done everything all my life to get to where I'm at, and yet I still feel unfulfilled, unsatisfied, I'm in pain. I don't want this anymore. I, it's time for me to do something different, which is why I come into their lives. I'm meant to unfuck their lives and get them to a place of <laughs> optimal peace and freedom with their successes. Love it. You help yeah. um, 
use their fear as fuel, right? Instead of instead of against them. I do the same thing. I talk about training your pain or it's going to train you. I think it's the same, right. it's the same, like a lot of alignment. Right. And so there is, there's just so much to, to what you said there. You know, everybody always quotes that the FDR line, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. And yeah, yeah so you just wrote your eyes at that. So that just tells you like, exactly. It's I'm like, and I was like, Oh yeah. So proud. And like, I get what he was trying to say. Sure now um and yet coming looking at it from a different perspective i was like ah <laughs> well if it, you know what I, you know the rolling the eyes is not to say that that's you know right. some cheesy cliche because there's right. value there's value there in value. these thought this thought leadership and these philosophies but they're all concept until you learn how to apply them until right. you really truly dive into understanding what it means for you individually. It's the Stoics talk about uh, ways in which we should optimize living our life without being so caught up in our emotions and being perceived anxiety and et cetera, et cetera. But people, it's easy to hear these concepts. It's easy to listen to a guru talk about these things, but there's a complexity to them that applies to each individual life differently based on where you're at and what your capacity really is. So there's nothing to fear, but fear itself. Yeah, there, we do fear fear which is why we teach people on how to override it, conquer it, or get rid of it. And that's why nobody actually ever accomplishes those three things. Fear always is going to show up again. Why? It's because fear is a part of us. We're human beings. It's a, it's a signal to us. Something is, is challenging us and shaking up our psyche in a way for us to look at what's actually beyond the discomfort of this situation or this moment. Because we're not being chased by wild animals anymore. We're not facing falling off a cliff. So what are we really fearing? We're fearing ourselves. We're fearing what's really inside us that's driving us to do what we do. And there's a way in which we can battle those demons that cause that fear to stimulate us to walk away from things that are uncomfortable versus embrace them and realize there's so much more gold in those moments than there is in feeling slightly uncomfortable and, and at least knowing what's coming. That's, that's the key piece of what I do. Yeah. And I think that applies to so many people on so many levels. I think anybody, if you're listening to this and think about your life now, like when's the last time you got up and you looked forward to your day? Um, and why was it right? Like if you get up and you know that at 10 o'clock every Tuesday morning, you're going to be in this place in that office working on that problem. And then at five 15, you're going to be at the grocery store at six o'clock and be home making tacos on Tuesday. And this is what you're going to like, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> I can't even get through that scenario without like dying a little inside. Right. right, right. But I know that for a lot of people that makes them feel good. You know, they've, good. that makes them feel good. So I don't want to come off as like judgmental and like judging people's lives or how they live, but I would challenge these people to inject just a little, just a little uh, in your life. Right. Like just yeah, try no. it. Like just, yeah. Like, yeah. like take a different path home or go to the grocery store on Wednesday night or something like switch it up a little <laughs> sure. and see what happens. Like just mix it up. What are some little ways why that people who have an extremely structured life, whether mm. by design or out mm -hmm. of need, right? Yeah. What are some ways that people can inject just a little bit of like spark and change up their, their life a little to just start. So if people don't want to take the massive plunge now, if, if there's somebody listening and they're like, I am, I do hate my life. I do want to change this. I do want to do this, but they have all these 500 steps and eight kids and responsibilities and all this, right. and they need to start slowly. What are some ways that people can start slowly to light that fire and kind mm. of take off? Oh, that's good. Because again, I join you in your sentiment. I'm, there's no knocking people that have structured lives. If it works for you, fantastic. If you're someone who goes, I meant for more, I want more, I'm, I'm driven to get and achieve more, that's when you have to recognize, okay, maybe my the structure or the routine that I have is not fulfilling me enough to get me to actually experience what I say I want more of. Some people live their lives, they're happy, they make a good living, stay there. Do not feel like you're wrong or bad for not becoming right. some multimillionaire because you didn't go out and have a bigger purpose to help humanity. We all support humanity in our own lanes. If you're doing it over here this way, great. You're doing something good. Stay connected to that. If you want to challenge yourself, you can start as small uh, as uh, getting up with your alarm clock consistently is a huge thing for most people. I mean, I've, I've fallen guilty in the past myself of all the things I've done in the military. I just wanted to sleep in. But then I recognize, you know what? How do I challenge myself? to expand my work ethic more. Well, I started getting up at 5.30 in the morning. The next thing I know, I'm up at five. 
And I, next thing you know, I'm waking up randomly at 4.45. I don't do it all the time. But I started to challenge myself with the smallest things like maybe at the end of a hot shower in the morning, you turn it to cold for 15 seconds and give yourself the permission to experience something that you know is going to feel very uncomfortable in that brief moment. But you're going to give yourself those baby steps to just embrace it. Recognize that when you can embrace the smallest challenges, little by little, they grow into the bigger challenges and you grow alongside that. It's like slow is smooth, smooth is fast philosophy in the military. The reason why we become so elite with our weapon system is because we don't just jump into it and become expert marksmen it's just by firing a weapon, putting it against our shoulder, racking a magazine into the, the weapon system. It's, it's because we learn the fundamentals. We start small and we build from that. So I would say people with routine structures is challenge yourself by finding something very small that startles you a little bit. Maybe doing, like you said, maybe walking home at night for a different path might feel very daunting, but that's the very thing you need to shake yourself up on the inside. One of my biggest philosophies, Barb, for your audience is that if it doesn't shock you, it won't change you. It doesn't matter how big it is. It can be small. Doing something completely different at nighttime with your routine can shock you from the inside and change. it'll change you. Then you can just build off of that. Do not try to jump from where you're at to some, you know, Navy SEAL level stuff because you're going to fall on your face trying to jump that many steps ahead. You just got to give yourself permission to find anything and everything that's around you. If it, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, do it anyway. And then build off of that. What are some of the common, so you help people, let, let's get a better, clearer idea for people who you serve and mm. how you do it, right? So who is, do you, ha, do you have a typical kind of client? I don't, I don't like, I don't like the word typical. I don't, don't get, don't get hung up on that word, sure, but no do problem. you have a, one kind of person who tends to seek you out over another? Hmm. So I recognize the capacity that I was brought into this world to fulfill. And through those life experiences from baseball, learning about myself in the world of rodeo, going into the military to really challenge and stretch myself, discovering in combat that I possessed a gift that I was brought into this world with. Cultivating that gift through my years of self-development, self-mastery, realizing when I started to do my work professionally, the type of people that I found myself around, the type of people that were attracted to me were people in positions of power and influence. Because of my capacity, the way I was built, my warrior nature, jumping into the foxhole in the trenches with these people, my typical clients are high-powered leaders, no matter what their industry is. I've worked in Wall Street to Hollywood, professional sports, personal development influencers and public figures, politicians, et cetera. It doesn't matter what their titles are. These are people that have developed certain capacities themselves. They've gotten to a level of success that I am built to support, which is why my work is not for everyone. I am not meant for the masses. I support three to four clients per year because my work is not a program or a system. It's truly a relationship that I have with my clients where I am literally in their lives with them, like the military, 24-7 challenging and stretching and pushing them far beyond where their own limits really are, what they've built. So my typical client is someone of influence power, prominence that has an impact on the masses. I slay the demons of a powerful few so that the masses can be uplifted vibrationally like you talked about earlier, and they can actually change for the better. Because right now, if you pay attention to what's going on, everything's falling apart around us because our leaders themselves are not living as optimally as, as they could. So that has been my business model and who I focus on. Yeah. And I think that is a good track to go on. You know, we have, we talk about, you talk about how people can like unfuck themselves. Right. But this country collectively needs to do that. Our country <laughs> is fairly <laughs> fucked right now. Um, yes. and, and we need yes. like, it's down to people. <laughs> yes. We need people in positions of power and leadership. Of course, like it'd be nice if they were at least marginally sane and Good hearted, right? Um, that would be that would be a good place to start. But it needs it needs to be you and me and our neighbor and the guy and our teachers and our healthcare workers and you know our bus driver. It needs to be everyday Americans who are going to go out there and we can't. We talk about what we do. We talk about strengthening ourselves and our families and our communities because that's going to strengthen our country, right? Sure. Um, you could switch out the word for strengthen to unfuck, right? You could. It's the same. Concept. So we need to do this for ourselves and our families 
in our in our country in our communities because that's how we're going to correct we're going to course correct our country. I think. Um, well, that's I and, and I, I will say that I'll expand on that because yeah. I want people to recognize this and, and, and understand this too. You can't unfuck yourself. I, I don't care how many gurus and, and coaches right, right. and consultants out there will teach you that you can do it yourself. Nobody does it themselves. I don't, I don't subscribe to the self-made anything model because nobody does it on their own. There's no such thing as anyone self-making them a billionaire or a multimillionaire or a, no, a leader. No, no, but you do it by seeking out the help that can help you do it, that can teach you. Yes. And I understand that the difference between, you know, someone having the trust fund given to them versus quote self-made, which is what they're trying to explain. But in reality is, it's like, I didn't read a book to become a soldier. I went through a framework in an environment that stretched me and challenged me mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. You understand this intimately well yourself, being, uh, being part of the, the military and doing what you've been doing, is that was the environment. And those were the types of resources that were around us that allowed us to unleash our own power and our own potential so that we can become these elite fighting machines when we went to war, which is why we were able to do our job so effectively. Same thing when it comes to personal development and growth is you cannot unfuck yourself. You need the right resources, the right containment, the right outside force that will hold you in the space when you want to squirm your way out of it and wiggle away from the discomfort that comes from real transformation and growth. The second part is, for your audience to understand this as well, is real transformation happens in the dark corners. It's ugly, it's uncomfortable, and it's a destructive process. If you are not experiencing that with anything you're doing with your coaches, your therapists, et cetera, you're only going to create some space to understand things, concepts, et cetera, to live by, but you're not really going to experience a true unleashing of what you're capable of. You're not going to experience real transformation of who you are. And that is where I think we are absolutely missing when it comes to our leaders at the top is these people are circumventing. They're stuffing down all the truth and they're trying to operate as if from some conscious standard that they think they know what's best for people, which is why the result that we see in our communities and our society, right? It's it's people falling apart, it's infrastructures collapsing, it is political divide, it is conflict, it is chaos, people are arguing, nobody knows how to have proper discourse anymore. And it starts with those that have influence and power. If they are not living their best optimal lives, they're going to infect all of us at the bottom. Oh, I love how you said that we threw in the word infect in the bottom. I don't know if you noticed, but when you just started on that track of conversation there, your, your energy was already up, but you like just came through and just freaking punch me with your energy there. Like you just, I'm like, I got, I got a little dose of what it would be like to be trained to work with by Wiley McGraw there, because you could feel the intensity and you could feel the, the laser focus you have and the conviction with which you speak, you know, and that just, I think that only comes from, from a place that you can't fake. Yeah. You, know, you just can't bullshit that. Right. So, um, well, that's the biggest I, thing for me is I, yeah. I, 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 I uncover the people's bullshit and I really yeah. want more than anything for people to truly know what peace and freedom and satisfaction is supposed to feel and look like when they are successful. And for me, I discovered that intense version of myself that my family scrutinized. It was like the, the, the suppressive nature of wanting me to be wrong for being a warrior, to being built with this like intensity, this fire that I have that lives inside of me. I, I had to break away and go down my own path against mm -hmm. whatever anybody wanted and expected of me so that I can know who I really am. And this is who I really am, which is what you're feeling is I was built to battle these demons that people possess, that they carry on with stresses, setbacks, obstacles, traumas, et cetera, whatever is harboring inside someone, a leader, a powerful person, a successful CEO, et cetera. My job is to get into the trenches with them and to confront it head on with them like their battle buddy, no matter what it is, so they can finally face it. We can slay it, eradicate it, and get them to where they actually were meant to be living. So that the byproduct, the results yes. of that are, are a more optimized, balanced, peaceful society, better infrastructure, better policy, better decision making. There's, there's fairness, equality in certain areas that it belongs in, et cetera. We don't have that because our leaders are literally like, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And that's the problem. We don't have yes. enough people fighting them head on. We have too many people basically catering to their dysfunctions and, and selling them beautiful, shiny, repackaged, repurposed programs. They're coaching and consulting them from a place of making money first and foremost, instead of how well are you living your life? That's success. 
Yeah. Yeah. All, all good stuff. What can you give it for instance, say a, 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 I'm your client, right. Or whatever, whatever, for instance, you want to use, um, with a, with just any one of a, of a theme you see in a demon, if you will. And, and like, what is one demon that you help people slay? And are there, are there methods that you generally apply? I know, I know that everything has to be tailored to each person, which is why I'm stumbling over the words a little, trying to figure That's out okay. how to phrase yeah, this I question. get what you're going with. Yep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, is there like a, is there a, for instance, path that you could choose if whatever a demon, choose a demon and, and, and for instance, on how some one thing that somebody does with you to begin uh, the process. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, my, my work is such an experience. It's a, truly, yeah. I'm an experience. I'm not a, a yeah, product. I'm sensing that. <laughs> and trying to distill it down into yeah. something specific could come across to the average person listening as like, well, that seems basic. How does that differ from what a therapist right. So it's do? what I'm trying to get. It's not like you, I come into you and I sit down, we have a 45 minute session no. and I talk about, it, and then you're like, okay, time's up and we no. have to go now and I'll see you no. in a week. Like, that's, or is it, is, is it like, are you, are you connecting with me every day? Is it a so weekly thing? Yeah. Is it a monthly thing? Are we calling each other? Are we zooming? Am I, so Are that's the thing is unfucking tasks human, for me to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yes. Unfucking a human life is my purpose, my calling. I was born into this world as a demon slayer. And we use that term again. It, it is who I am. That's my, that's just the nature of my presence and my being. Demons can be anything. It can be anything that you, har you right. harbor from your life experiences that were negative, detrimental to you. We confront them head on together. So the nature of my work really is connecting an intimate relationship, providing them a, a framework through that relationship to truly experience in real time. Because that's the thing is life happens in real time. I don't set up calls with someone like Tuesday at 11, we're going to have a phone conversation to, to address your terror around making money. <laughs> doesn't work that way. It's right. truly about where my work and who I am and what I've done over the years, the last 14 years doing this professionally has been intimate relationship dynamics with the people I work with. Meaning I be, I basically take on their lives. They become, we're integrated together. I'm like that, an additional family member now where the work I do is about assuming and integrating into their lives, leaving no stone unturned. Doesn't matter. You can't hide anything from me. If we will not say that's off limits and this is on limits, period. If I've got to go after other elements of your life, other relationships, I will. What matters here is recognizing that I am serving as that type of loving, caring support that they've never had, where I'm fully integrated, seeing where their lives are actually happening, where the blind spots really reside and exist 24-7 for a specifically determined amount of time. But I don't just jump into a relationship with anybody just because they can afford it or they've got the status or the caliber. What matters is having conversations, calibrating, getting to know someone, making sure this is the right fit on both sides. I need to determine whether or not there's someone I want to work with. I've got to ensure they've got the capacity to embrace what I'm going to put them through, the intensity and level of self-mastery that they're going to go through where they won't quit or try to run away from it or try to make it wrong. I'm not saying they won't battle me through the whole process, but it really is about being integrated into their lives where I live with my clients, I travel with my clients, I'm everywhere they need to be. I doesn't mean they stop, doesn't mean I, I have to go 24 seven wherever they are in that moment, but whatever's necessary, if I experience it, I see it, that's where I'm gonna go. So battling a demon really is part of the, of the experience in the relationship. It's truly about integrating so that I can basically see where they are and confront them head on. And as they are being confronted, we work on them together. I'm like, again, like the battle buddy that's in the foxhole with them. Cool. That's yeah. hardcore. That's, that's intense. So like a, about how deep is the vetting process that you put somebody through before you determine if you're a good match and you can work with them? It, it all, it truly all depends on them. I had yeah. a conversation with a gentleman who is wildly successful from a financial standpoint. I had a former client of mine reach out from years ago said, hey, I have a, a colleague who is in pain. He, he's done all of this, done, achieved this, he, but he still feels the way I felt when I met you. Would you be willing to have a conversation? And I said, absolutely. And we had an hour long phone call. And, you know, he, again, I already experienced in the first few minutes kind of where he, where actually things are, are falling apart for him. And I, he said, what's next? And what do we need to do? I said, what, what's next is we continue to have conversations like this.
I'll fly to you. We'll go break some bread together. We'll sit down. We'll get to know each other. This is See, this is the piece, Barbara, that's missing in personal development is intimacy, real world connection, understanding mm-hmm. that a human life is not some compartmentalized system. We are these holistic, dynamic, nitty gritty beings that have our own unique sets of challenges and setbacks. Most coaches and consultants don't want to, let, maybe they're not built to jump into those types of dynamics with people and that's okay. But for the nature of my work and the type of people I support, is I don't help them. I unfuck them. I optimize them by giving them the environments to truly discover who they are without all of the weight of the things they've carried around inside them. So the vetting process really is about building a relationship. This guy you know, immediately was trying to reject the idea of you know, the fact that I wouldn't give him certain information. It's like, why does my age matter to you? You're distracting right now. Why does this matter to you? You're distracting. Let's focus on just getting to know each other. And he was like, wow, I've never had a phone call where you're not just going to tell me what I want to know. I'm like, that's not the point of this. You're on the call because your your colleague said you needed support. I'm here. I want to discover whether or not we're going to be a good fit. And he just didn't understand in the beginning why I would not divulge information. I said, this isn't a two-way street right now. This is about you, not me. Who cares about me? <laughs> and getting people to stop being so distracted. And when people start doing that, that means they're trying to control the environment. They're trying to control the way they feel. They're trying to, they see it as like, well, you're human too. So you might have problems as well. It's like the fact that you're acting that way with me, just means that we're probably not going to work well together. If that's what, how you're going to come at this, then that's okay. I'm, I'm not your person. So it all depends yeah. on the individual and where they need to go, where they're at. And what I see is going to be best to get them to the, to that destination. I guess there's really no point in trying and wanting to work with you if you're not going to put your trust in you. Like if I'm going to say yes, why, if I'm going to go through this process and you're going to say, yes, Barb, I can work with you. And then I'm like, ah, I actually don't really trust you. And you're like, well, go continue well, somebody, yourself then. Here, here's the thing. <laughs> if somebody says, if somebody says yeah. that to me, I, I immediately, it's first and foremost, it's not me. They don't trust. It's themselves. Right. Yeah. Because I, I know who I am. I know, I know the, the type of, of power I possess, the intensity that I carry. And I know that when I'm in someone's presence, I'm an eruptor. I'm going to erupt the deepest, yep. darkest truths that they have not faced. And if somebody's like, well, I don't trust you. That's their ego telling them to run because their demons are now speaking for them. And I no longer have the person in front of me anymore. See, that's, right. that's the other piece your audience can learn from is we always say, trust your gut. Well, how do you know your gut's actually accurate right now? If you have not faced your own demons, how do you know that your own stresses are not speaking for you? They're not clouding your psyche, your ego and making your ego tell you, I don't trust this guy in front of me because I don't like the way I feel with him. Well, maybe you need to consider why I'm in front of you to begin with. Right. You think I'm here just to what harm you? No, you're feeling stuff that my presence is erupting, rattling within. How about you embrace that? Continue the conversation and see if it dissipates or if it, it, it subsides through our integration together, our calibration. And that's the key. When someone says, I don't trust you, I'll be like, you just don't trust yourself. This has nothing yeah. to do with me. Yeah, true. Yeah. And also, do you think that sometimes that whole resistance comes from, like we're in, our instinct is to protect ourselves from, yep. from pain and fear and discomfort, right? And they're like, yep. oh, okay, I thought I wanted to help, but this guy is like no bullshitter. I'm not going to be able to just say I went for help and it didn't work and then blame the person for not helping me. Like, this is yeah. like the real person. Like if I go with this person, like I'm actually going to have to do the work, right? I can't just blame him. I'm going to have to face my truth. And I'm going to have to like, like this. Is, yeah, this is like, and then they just shut down, right? And try to find reasons. Well, they, like, and that, what they do is they they create a, a story on why right. uh, I had a bad feeling about I, this. Yeah, right. It's like, okay. He was just another one of those pieces. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. It's not Super telling me anything I want to know. I can talk yeah. to you yeah. about this all day, but before we end, we were going to run out of time. And I do want to touch on your military service because you know okay. that is near, <laughs> near and dear to me, right? Yes. Um, yes. And especially because you, you know, you and I talked a little bit just now about what is happening in this country and how things are eroding and falling apart. I never served, but I felt the weight of service. You know, I felt I felt the consequence of service. Um, but I don't know what it's like to do any of the things that you were talking about. I don't know what it's like to literally jump into a foxhole. I don't know what it's like to be the one on the front line. I, you know, I so I have such massive respect for all of you who do that. Just the biggest respect for people who do that. And I'm always curious to know what 
it is like from your perspective to see what is happening in this country today, you know? So can you touch a little bit on your service and just give us a little bit background of the depth of your service? So, sure. you know, people know that kind of have that founding and then go into what, what your thoughts are and how the service impacts what you're, what you're seeing in this country. That's uh, beautiful. Uh, I want to honor you though, being still a military family that you, you sacrifice and you go through your own experiences regardless of being able to say that you can talk about what we go through being in combat, but you have your own unique sets of challenges, being a, a family member, a spouse, et cetera. So I, I commend you on that one. I want to make sure everybody that is listening to this, that may have been a military spouse or a family member, there's unique sacrifices you make. So thank you for your service. My service came out of Number one, every man in my family has served in every major conflict since World War II, at least to my recollection. I think I have family members in Ireland and Scotland that served in conflicts over there. But my grandfathers were both uh, part of D-Day in Normandy uh, during yeah. uh, World War II. Um, my uncles were all special operations, you know, Vietnam, Desert Storm. My, my stepfather and both my brothers and I served. My father was a corpsman in Vietnam. So we've there's this just steep tradition of the love that we have for our ability to wake up. And I, I thought about this the other day before you and I were going to talk. I thought, you know what? I want to share this with Barbara and her audience is how lucky are we that we do have the ability to wake up in this nation and have choice regardless where other people are just struggling to survive. We have the choice on whether or not we suffer, whether or not we succeed, whether or not we get to experience what we want. And that's such a beautiful thing. And I think at a young age, we all recognize the luxury and the love that we have for that choice. Um, I know this country is not perfect and that's, that's not the point of the conversation. So for me, when I joined, my brothers joined, we wanted to go honor that. We wanted to provide value and service out some of something outside of ourselves. And I know that sounds cliche, but truly most military members do that because that's what we care about. It's like, I want to give back to something I was born into that I get to appreciate and value and everybody in my family served. So it was a time honored tradition to do it. And my middle brother and I did a junior Marine Corps program uh, back in the day. We fell in love with it. We're like, what do we want to do? I said, well, I want to go jump out of airplanes and go to ranger school. He was like, well, I want to go be a SEAL. I thought, perfect. That, that will go down our routes. I joined the Army, served with the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, as they call it, for, for six years. I did three tours overseas with them. My middle brother actually became special operations himself uh, with the Army Rangers, 75th Ranger Regiment. And then my youngest brother became a corpsman, Greenside uh, Fleet Marine Force corpsman. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And now he's back in as a Navy officer, as a surgeon. My middle brother got out after eight years uh, being uh, 100% disabled, completely wounded in combat, the whole, whole nine yards. But for me, my service, being a combat infantry leader, um, specializing in more gun systems, I found... Um, I stay connected to a greater purpose. I recognize that despite what political aspects or ambitions are, are ahead of what we're doing here in these different countries, there's still a deeper reason in why we're here. The way in which I experienced culture in those environments from Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, the people that I met, the appreciation and gratitude for how our presence was in fact uplifting their lives, the way in which we interacted with them on the ground, how we took care of these people is not widely, you know, uh, you know, uh, covered by the media, you know, it's not really shared so much as the destruction is shared. And then when I got out of the military after doing that for six years, and I, you know, I almost stayed in to go, go either fly Blackhawks or be part of, you know, the, the SF community. Um, I took what I learned about myself in combat and I wanted nothing more than to provide that service ongoing to other leaders, other people so that they can in fact better other people's lives as well. So I just stayed connected to that and nowadays, what I'm recognizing is that it's not about political party. It's not about, you know, differences of opinion, because that's what makes America America is we're all this melting pot of crazy, awesome, different culture backgrounds and opinions and, and perspectives. It was meant to be that way as an experiment so that we can show the world that we can, in fact, coexist despite having dif differences of opinion, perspective, et cetera. What really irritates me the most or pisses me off is the fact that we have lost our ability to actually have balanced proper discourse. So there's no more decorum. There's no more respect for one another. There's no more uh, uh, understanding. Everybody has their own unique sets of, of experiences and challenges that are, are birthing their own opinions and perspectives. We are no longer abiding by real argumentation and debate. Everybody just wants to be right. Nobody wants to do what's right. Everyone thinks that they're the patriot and they're the enemy. 
And then the other side does the same thing. And to me, as someone who served my country, to see the debacle that has been has resulted of this discourse drives me mad because it's like, what is the point of having the military to do what we do if our people are going to abuse the freedoms that they actually take for granted? They're going to abuse the ability to have good conversations with great people, despite our ability to disagree with certain things. And finding in argumentation, what I learned in college is all about finding middle ground, you know, finding the best solution so that we all can succeed together so we could all be uplifted. And I, to me, I see that desecrated right now. And that drives me nuts because then I watch my friends die in combat. I've seen my brother suffering because of his combat experience and all the people that we now know and talk about that have given their lives this ultimate sacrifice. And this is what we're going to result as this nation that says, I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. It's unacceptable for me. And our leaders are the biggest culprits in that. Love it. Man, I could keep you on for hours and hours and hours. So yeah, I mean, really, thank you for all that. I could go into that. And I say too, I'm like, look, I know that when my husband went over there, he didn't, he didn't go over there saying, you know what, whatever happens over there, I'm only going to serve conservatives or Democrats or people who agree with me or white people or brown people or gay people. He's like, he's like, I'm going to serve my country. (laughs) You know, and to be a part of our country's efforts to serve the world. Um, and that's, really. and and that's the preamble to the Constitution is we the people. Yeah. They, they wrote we the people first long right. before they created the Bill of Rights, which is all right. about individual freedoms, because they understood that, yes, we have our individual liberties. We need to respect those. But there's a containment to that. And we've lost the containment. Everybody just wants to do whatever they want to do. And uh, no consequences, no accountability on both yeah. sides of the aisle on both right. d- divides. And it's like, this is why we're falling apart. And that's the piece that really drives me nuts is we served for the overall containment and structure uh, that gives us the freedoms that we, that we possess. Yeah. And that's all yeah. being sort of shit on right now in it is. multitude <laughs> directions. On all like, sides. I mean, everybody. Like a lot of fans yeah. are being hit with a lot of shit now. And the spray is hitting all of us. <laughs> you know? Like, and that's why I'm passionate about my work of unfucking yeah. leaders, because this is yeah. where I've had someone go, hey, I need to pull you into politics. I had met a guy who's going to be running for uh, you know, office in 2024, and he goes, would you be willing to participate in supporting me to make sure that I'm on my best in my campaign trail? So the universe is clearly telling me it's time for me to step into politics, because this is where these people need the most unfucking possible, truly. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. I love that. And I actually, I even like hearing that somebody running for office had the self-awareness or, and the intent to, to understand that he needs somebody to like have his back and, and help right. him guide him like perspective, you know, an eagle. And for me, yeah. And for me, yeah. it's kind of like, I'm going to infiltrate into that world That's through great. him, through him and That's then great. meet other people that I can support and, yes. and, and see where my business and my work can go because I, I, I'm more connected to my beacon and my purpose than anything else. And the, the luxuries that I get afforded for the life that I live is just the byproduct of my focus on what matters most. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. All right, Wiley. So I'm going to, I might have to sock you and just keep getting you back because you're like the topics, man, we could just go into all over. I appreciate I really you on it. many, many levels. Thank you so much. If Thank people you. want to connect with you, follow you, find you online, learn more about what you do, um, where can they find you? Well, you know, I, I told you earlier. Um, oh, and the podcast, we got to talk about your podcast coming up. Yeah. So too. we have Wise Words and Whiskey yes. with Wiley McGraw it goes live October 27th on Apple Podcasts. I'm actually doing a giveaway that they can yeah. find on WileyMcGraw.com, which obviously I can send you those links for your show notes, et cetera. We'll share those out a, for sure. Yeah. I'm doing a whiskey giveaway. So each month for a little while to celebrate this new podcast, I'm going to be giving away a premium bottle of whiskey with a uh, set of hard bottom rocks glass. Uh, this beautiful set and a chance for someone to come on my show as well as a guest. Um, so they can find that there at wileymcgraw.com. But, you know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I, I'm starting to get active on that platform as well, having conversations with people. Uh, LinkedIn.com forward slash Wiley McGraw is another place. But uh, ultimately, I'd love for people to subscribe to the new podcast when it goes live and, and start listening to some really cool low-key conversations on high-performance living, distilling down the work that I do with leaders so that people can really chew on really cool insights and wise words that can change their life in a very 
uh, in a meaningful way. And if you'd love, I'd love to have you on the show as well, Barb, that'd be fantastic to bring you on and have a great conversation. Nice. I'm down for yeah. all of that. And we'll definitely share awesome. yours, share yours out too. Um, I love it. I love connecting. Thank you, Tony Watley for connecting us. And, I know, and right? That, Thanks, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> that it's is great. like such a great thing, right? If you don't put yourself out there to meet people, this is how you grow. And one person introduces you to another and then your network grows. So I love it. My kids look at me all the time. like, mom, you know, a lot of people. I'm like, I know, isn't it great? <laughs> It's how it works. That's how my business was built was just around relationships. I didn't even need digital for for 12 plus years until the pandemic. But it's really about making great connections and relationship and forging those and allowing the right results to show up for you when you're you're more committed to that kind of uh, connection. It's it's unbelievably magical what what happens. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. Great. Wiley, thank you again so much. We're going to definitely keep a current to keep our, we'll keep our audience current on when your show comes out and where they can find you and reach you. And we'll put all your links up there for people to, to do the same. So thanks again. Love it, Barb. Thank you very much.